Welcome to Vancouver Business Network, where entrepreneurs learn, network, and grow. I'm Roger Killen, the organizer. This evening, Mike Garska is training us on how to achieve win-win outcomes from difficult conversations. Mike, can we start with a few get to know you questions? Sure, First, thanks. what do you see as being the most important turning point in your life? Actually, I, I, see, I think there was two. Uh, at a very young age, I learned, I re learned about Napoleon Hill and learning about uh, the power of positive thinking and the power of the mind. And the other one was actually learning uh, what I'm training tonight, the uh, communication stuff. Made a big uh -huh. difference in my life. Okay. Wonderful. Second question is, what do you love most about your work as a consultant? Uh, I love seeing the transformation in businesses and the people. And uh, what I find is uh, when we put our programs into businesses is everybody gets a little bit more peace of mind. Productivity goes up, retention rates go down or go, go up. I mean, they get better and uh, it's actually quite rewarding. Good, so it's a personal satisfaction you experience, wonderful. And finally, I thought um, the audience would like to know what the, what's the number one thing that, thing that in your opinion holds people back from being their absolute best? Uh, I think it's two things uh, would be, actually the, the number one thing is probably self-talk and, uh, and how they talk to themselves. And uh, I, I had a good friend once say to me that if we talk to other people like we talk to ourselves, we wouldn't have any friends. <laughs> and, I, and I think that really affects uh, outcomes in our life. Oh, yes, it does indeed. That's oh so true. I uh, had a situation today. I, I cannot remember where it was. A lady a ladies has a course that's all about our self-talk and how we can switch it from being three to one, negative to positive. So um, you and she would be two peas in a pod. Yeah. yeah. Audience <laughs> members, whenever you have a question, would you type it into the chat? And periodically in the course of Mike's presentation, I'll interrupt him and pose your questions. That way, by the end of this talk, you've had an answer to each and every one of your questions. The video recording of Mike's training will be made public about uh, an hour and a half uh, after the end of his uh, talk. And I'll send a link to everybody who had registered for it so you can rewatch it. Uh, you don't have to take notes because you're going to get the recording. Mike, are you ready to rock the stage and wow us with your incredible wisdom? I was born ready, Roger. You were born ready then. <laughs> Show us, take it away, do your thing. Off we go, Mike. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you, Roger, for the introduction. Um, so I'm here to help you navigate and give you some tips on navigating those difficult conversations to win-win outcomes. And a couple of quick questions. How many people here type yes in the chat room. If you have a difficult conversation that you've either been avoiding or you've got coming up, uh, just type yes in the chat room. Roger, if you could read me back those numbers as, as you see them come in. And the other question I have, do you have more difficulty with those tough conversations that come up at, in work or in business or in personal life or maybe sales presentations? So type an S for sales. B for business and P for personal. And again, Roger, at some point when you get those numbers, let me know what they are and we'll thus, go from there. Thus far, you've had uh, six yeses, one B, one B, oh, three Bs, okay. lots of Bs. Lots of Bs, okay, that's perfect. <laughs> Gives me an idea of, you know, kind of the way or, where I wanna go with some stories. Anyway, uh, so um, I'm here today to give you a mission to start with. And your mission today, is very simple. First, to learn how people communicate. I call it the human interaction process. And your second mission is to learn a seven step framework for how to navigate difficult conversations and decide what area you're going to improve in. So that's your mission today. Keep that in the back of your mind as we go through the presentation. I'm gonna start by giving a little bit of background on me 
and uh, then lead into the uh, tough talks. Um, so I, I got my start, excuse me. I got my start in industrial sales, first on inside sales at very young age, started at 20 years old. And then by 24, I moved into outside industrial sales with uh, industrial rental companies. So the, cu the customers were construction companies and mines and gas plants and refineries and mills and that kind of thing. And then into sales management. And it was in between sales and sales management. I'd been with a company for about two and a half years and the general manager left the company and the sales manager was promoted. And so that left a gap, we had no sales manager. And I started to notice that things were falling through the cracks. I was getting customer complaints. The sales manager wasn't there to be our liaison between the sales department and the other department's managers and so on and so forth. And things were falling through the cracks. So my standard response at that time in my life was to start looking for work and take another job. I don't need this stuff. And I started to do that. But it was also around that time that my wife actually suggested that I take this communications and leadership workshop that she had taken. So I agreed. She said, it's going to be great for work and for our relationship. So I said, sure, great. And I took that course and I was actually blown away. It was a weekend and a half, so three-day workshop. And first of all, I was blown away as how, how, at how well it fit into that stuff that I learned from Napoleon Hill and Norman Vincent Peale and Wayne Dyer and all that kind of, those kind of people. And the second thing that blew me away is how simple it was. And I wondered, why didn't they teach me this stuff in school? It should be part of the school system. And I was actually quite peeved about the whole thing. And since then, I've taught it to a few people and I've had students say to me, why don't they teach me this in school? But they don't. And so we, teach it through employers and through programs like this. So anyway, I took that course and instead of quitting, I decided, you know, what I really want here is I want a promotion. So instead of taking jobs that I had been offered, I decided to have a dinner meeting with the general manager. I asked him for dinner. He said, yeah, let's do it tomorrow night. He said, I've got lots of things that are bugging me. I've got to talk to you. I'm very concerned. And I took what I learned in the program. I planned my conversation. I was very specific on the facts of the details of the issues. I actually had over a three week period, two pages of issues. And I, and I was very specific. What happened specifically, who was involved from our company perspective, who the customer was, what the result was. And I made that plan and I went into the conversation. We had, it was a two hour dinner. I shared all the facts, how I felt about it, what I thought about it, what I wanted. I asked him about the same questions. And by the end of the meeting, he actually assured me that everything would be resolved. And he made me sales manager right then and there and gave me a raise. And so from what I learned in that three-day workshop, actually propelled me got, me, got me a promotion within two months. Very, very valuable information. And it has guided me um, throughout my career. So after working for other companies, about two years later, I got sick of working for other companies, making them a bunch of money. So I decided to start my own business. And I started a cell phone company right when they first came out, cell phones were first coming out, so they were very expensive. Started from the trunk of my car and moved to three stores and three million in annual sales within a nine year period. It was about year seven, we were into things and I was noticing that people were complaining and bickering and they weren't getting along. And I finally had enough. I said, okay, everybody, I've had enough of this, bickering and complaining. On Saturday morning, we're shutting the stores down. Everybody has to be here for a mandatory meeting and I'm gonna teach you guys how to communicate. And I wrote my first communications workshop and it made a huge difference. The salespeople were able to handle difficult customers more easy. The, uh, any of the infighting between departments, uh, they were, were able to resolve the issues. The shop people were able to deal with problem customers or suppliers, the administration people and customer service people, the same thing. Teaching them communications made a huge difference. And within a few months, it was common for the national cellular network to run contests. And we often had two of the top five performing stores in the country. And I attribute that to the salespeople knowing how to do difficult conversations and the customer service people and the getting along and all of that kind of stuff. I attribute most of that success to having a cohesive work team that knew how to communicate 
and move through difficult issues. So um, after um, nine years, I sold the stores, took the kids out of school. We actually traveled around the world to about 20 different countries, to Africa and uh, Europe, throughout Africa and Europe, came back and started consulting. And what I found, uh, one of my uh, first clients, not the first one, but one of them, came to me and said, Mike, we're having an issue with staff retention, revolving door, construction company that builds bridges. And I said, okay, so let's start by doing a full survey and finding out exactly what the issue is. So we did that. We created a 65 question survey together and we interviewed every person in the company. After completing the survey, we found that the number one issue was information and communication flow. And that breaks into two areas. One is systemic. So document control, meeting systems, review systems, um, even fun events and anything to do with communication. And the other one was people's ability or inability to do those tough conversations at crucial points. They avoided them or they did them ineffectively in anger and frustration and didn't get the outcomes that they wanted. And so we made a bunch of recommendations and I started to train their people. Within the first year, within the first 12 months, employee retention rates increased by 26%. Within three years, they were 60% better. And within about eight years, they were double what they were when we first started this process. So we know that communication is really, and, and the people in the business are really the determinants of the success of a business. I, I've always said people, business is about people and numbers. And I've worked with tons of chartered accounts. So I'm very familiar with numbers and financial statements, but my passion is the people. And so that's what I've worked towards. And we've done survey, many surveys since then. Every survey that we've done in a business, every single one, the number one issue is exactly the same, information and communication flow. And that, again, breaks into those two areas. So that's been my focus. And um, we start our training on how to do difficult conversations. I'm not going to go into all the system stuff. That's, uh, that's, that's a whole different presentation. But this one's about how to do those tough talks. And the first place I start, even when I'm mediating, and I've done lots of mediation within companies as well, I always start with this. And that is explaining the human interaction process. This is how people communicate. And we go through a five-step process when we're communicating with each other. The first thing that happens is one of our five physical senses kicks in. We see, hear, taste, smell or touch something. Now, in communicating, it's mostly uh, eyes and, and ears working. But for example, if I see Roger in the mall in Vancouver, and I walk up behind him and tap him on the shoulder from behind. In that case, it's his sense of touch that kicks off that human interaction process for him. So it can be any one of the five senses. As soon as we sense something, the next thing that happens automatically and very quickly and all this whole process actually happens automatically and very quickly, is that we get a feeling. And Daniel Goleman, author of Emotional Intelligence, and all his scientist friends have proved that the emotion actually triggers before the thought in the lower amygdala part of the brain. So we know that that's a fact. And when I first learned this human interaction process, they actually had it reversed to thoughts and feelings. But anyway, we sense, we feel, and then we think almost like it's instantaneously, it's milliseconds. So we sense, we feel, we think. And then from that, we gain an intention. And from the intention, we choose our action. And our action could be speaking words. It could be silence. It could be touching. It could be any number of things. But the process is we sense, we feel, we think, we intend, and we act. And it's an automatic process. And it's unique to individu each individual, just like DNA. So our automatic human, I call it the hip, our automatic hip response is a result of everything that we've taken in in our entire life from the time we're born. So the values and beliefs that our parents instill in us, the relationships we have with our siblings, then later with our classmates and our teacher, and then later with our workmates and our bosses, everything we watch on television, everything we see in a billboard or in a magazine, or even the video games we play. All of that information accumulates to create our instant, right now, automatic human interaction process response. 
And so if I want to alter my automatic responses, I need to alter the information that I'm bringing in. And that's one of the purposes of today's talks is to uh, bring in, uh, give you some more information. So in the hopes that your automatic process will shift just a little bit, especially when you're approaching those difficult conversations. Now, the basic guide is I use this HIP tool as a guide, first of all, to share what's going on for me in a conversation. And secondly, to find out what's going on for the other person. I wanna know what they're thinking, feeling, intending, and how they're gonna respond. And I want them to know what's going on for me in that process. So quickly, I want you to remember one thing. People think on average at a rate of 500 words a minute. And we speak on average at a rate of 100 words a minute. So there is 400 words a minute going on behind the scenes that we don't get to hear. And that's in with any people. So that's averages, but it's very important to understand that process. And so that we know uh, that we really don't know what's fully going on with the other person. And we don't have the opportunity to influence them, which is what our intention is about. It's the intention to influence until we find out what's going on for them. So what I do in coaching people to go through this difficult communications process is take them through a seven step framework called contact and contact is the acronym. Now the first C in contact stands for communicate with yourself first. And what do you communicate with yourself about? Well, you ask yourself the five questions. What did I see here and hear? What specific words did I hear? How do I feel? Where do I feel it in my body? What am I thinking? What are my thoughts about this? What do I want? And I like to double end that question. What do I want and what don't I want? And then well, how am I gonna to choose to act? What words am I gonna choose? What body language am I gonna express? Facial expression, tone of voice. What tone of voice am I gonna use? And in the full contact program where there's five hours of multimedia video, we give you uh, eight different videos about a whole different words not to use, different words to use, and uh, how to question and all of that kind of stuff. Um, for body language, and I'm gonna quickly stay on that, what we wanna do is make sure our body is open in a sensitive conversation. As soon as I'm closed off like this, then people close off. And so it's important that I keep my arms uncrossed, my legs uncrossed, my facial expression interested, and um, when I'm communicating with somebody. So uh, the second part of the contact program after we've communicated with ourself is to open up sure and wise. The O stands for open up sure and wise. And we're sure of two things. We're sure we're, we know what's going on for us because we've gone through our hip and we've questioned that. And we're sure that we don't know what's going on for the other person until we ask them and they tell us and we clarify. And so when I'm opening up, and again, this is a quick, a quick uh, version of all of this. What I quickly do is share one, usually one to three parts of my hip. And then I quickly ask about theirs. So the N in contact stands for notice the other person. So I might say, so I heard you say these words and it made me feel a little bit concerned. And I'm wondering what was going on for you when you said that, what were your thoughts? And what did you see that made you say those things? So if you notice in that statement, I shared two parts of my hip, what I heard them say. And then I asked, I told them what my thought, my feeling was concerned. And then I asked about them. And Stephen Covey, uh, one of our great thought leaders of the 1900s, um, one of his seven habits of highly effective people, and very important one, seek first to understand, then to be understood. And that fits extremely well into a difficult conversation process where I want a win-win outcome. Mike, uh, there, you're using a word that is a little confusing. I share two parts of my, it sounded like HIP, H-I-P. Yes, human interaction process. Okay. 
I thought I'd clarify. Thank you for mentioning that, Rog. When I say the word hip, I'm talking about our automatic human interaction process, which is, uh, which is sense, feel, think, contend, and act. And so uh, that's the five part of the process. So when I share my hip, I share two or three parts of that process. And then I ask about the other person's process. And so I communicate with myself first. I open up by sharing my hip and then I notice the other person quickly by asking about their hip. And then the uh, T in contact stands for tune in. So tune in means listen, actively listen. And in the full program, we give you 17 tips for active listening. But basically, I'm gonna give you a couple of real important ones here. When we tune in to somebody, what we wanna do is the first thing we wanna do is pause, and then we wanna zip it, and then we wanna snap on and face the speaker. And forget about doing anything else. Get the phone out of the way, get the computer out of the way, Turn off the television, stop looking around, snap on and face the speaker and just get a soft gaze. So look at their eyes, don't stare, but look at their eyes softly, move to their ears, you know, chin and move around their face and a little bit around their body, but basically stay snapped onto their face and listen to them. Keep your ears open. God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. If he gave us two mouths and one ear, society would be nuts. So let's stay with tuning in. And then after we tune in, and we actively listen, then we go to the second or the fifth part of contact, which is ask again, and clarify and make sure that you have your like what you heard, and how you're interpreting it is correct. So this opening up noticing the other person and tuning in, go quickly together, and then we start clarifying. And in this process of these first four steps, we will go back and forth and the conversation will go back and forth because every time I share something, the other person's process will start again. They'll hear me, they'll get a new feeling, thought and an intention and they'll share something. And so I see an effective conversation flowing like kind of like a figure eight. And as we cross that center point, that's where we want to start looking for commonalities. And when we're in this clarifying process, what we want to do is we want to take Stephen Covey's Seek First to Understand to the next level. And what that looks like is this. We want to actually seek first to validate the other person and then to get validated ourselves. So we're taking understanding to another level. Now, when a person doesn't feel validated, what happens is they disengage. And the way we validate somebody is by listening to their process and hearing how they feel and what they think about the topic at hand is real and true for them. That doesn't mean that that's my automatic response. And that doesn't matter. It is theirs and it's their truth. And if I negate it and say, what are you feeling or thinking like that for? That's silly, nobody thinks like that. As soon as I do something like that, that disengages them. It's much more appropriate to say something like, okay, so I hear that's what's going on for you. And I accept that that's your truth, but it's not my truth. Here's when this situation happens, here's how I think and how I feel. And do you understand that? And then I'll look to get validated myself. So in that ask again part of this process, we're looking to validate each person. And once we're both validated, then we can go to the second C in contact, which is, just checking my time frame here, um, which is to um, find common intentions. Now, when I've looked at many communications courses, they all talk about common ground. How many people here have heard about common ground? Uh, Got to find common ground to get resolve conflict. I submit that before we can establish any common ground, we first have to uncover common intentions. And 
Common intentions are very, very important. Again, I'm going through that figure eight and I'm looking for commonalities. So when I'm training people to find common intentions, the first thing I do is break them into two types of intentions. And we have primary intentions and we have secondary intentions. And primary intentions actually morph out of basic human needs. So uh, at the vlog blog at successtoolchess.com, we, we have a list of uh, basic human needs. There's a page of them. And there are things like a need to be loved, a need to give love, a need for appreciation, a need for uh, inclusion. And all of those basic needs, food, shelter, clothing, those basic primary intentions morph into a secondary intention. So now at work, in a work environment, it's actually fairly easy to get to this common intention area uh, in comparison to a deep uh, rooted personal relationship where emotions go very deep and, uh, and, and stakes are very high. In a work environment, finding common intentions can be quite simple and I'll explain to you why. First of all, um, we're both here to serve. We go to work to serve so we can get paid so that we can have food, shelter, clothing, and some fun. So we serve to get paid so that we can live our life. So we're both here to serve. Are you in agreement with that? Yes. And we're serving either internal or external customers. So if I'm coaching or working with one of my coworkers or uh, one of my employees, I start with that. We're here to serve, both of us. And we're here to serve our customers. Yes, yes. And I'm just gonna quick sidetrack here. I read in one communications training program that you wanna get the other person saying yes a minimum of three times in any difficult conversation and get them into that affirmative state of mind. Well, when we go through this process of validating the other person, we get agreement that that's what they're feeling and that's what I understand and this is what I'm feeling and you understand that, we get into that yes frame of mind. When we're discovering and exploring common intentions, the same thing happens. We're here to serve, yes, yes. And to serve our customers, we have to give them good service. Here is what they expect, do you agree? Yes. So what's the best way to deliver the service? I think the best way to deliver this service is this way. And my intentions are to deliver that service in an effective manner to keep the customer happy. How do you think the best way to deliver the service is? Now, they might have a little bit of a different idea than, than me. Now, businesses are dictatorships, just the way it is. So you have a hierarchy and the boss makes the final decision, but a well tuned in boss will be open to new suggestions. And it depends on the situation. If it's a critical point, hey man, this one is, this is a critical situation. I'm not gonna try a new suggestion in this situation. I know that this method works. So this is the way we're gonna do this. Next time, we'll try your way and see what the outcome is. But the bottom line is we want to explore our common intentions. And when we get to that point, what happens naturally as we explore our common intentions, the commonalities to serve is solutions naturally appear. And in that process, once the solutions appear, that's when we can go to the last, um, the, the, the last T in contact, which is to take it next level. And to take a conversation next level and a solution next level, we do three things. First of all, out of the solutions, we identify action items for each individual. So um, we agree what, and, and, and like one person's action, items, action item might simply be to listen or to review. And the other person's action items, so if I'm correcting somebody on coming in late, their action item is to come in late. And my action item might be to supervise that they're here on time or their action item is to come in on time, I, I'm sorry. Um, so we assign action items. How many people here have been to meetings and after the meeting, thought, what the heck was that meeting all about? Nothing happened. Or we go to meetings and nothing happens. We talk about things, but nothing happens. If, you, if, that, if you're familiar with that scenario, type a yes in the chat box. The reason that that happens 
is because people don't assign action items after the discussion. I don't think we should, and, and, and a crucial conversation is a meeting between two or more people. And a meeting is a meeting of a group. If we're in a meeting of any type, not assigning action items is a big mistake. When I conduct meetings with clients, we don't walk away without action items. Same thing with a crucial conversation. Action items, and then we record them in a text or an email and send them off. So if you've committed to doing something and you get a text or an email that says that you committed to doing this, just reminding you, do you feel more accountable? If that's the case for you, type yes in the chat room. When we send out our commitment in a text or an email, it makes people feel more accountable. It's the same thing as keeping minutes in a meeting. Mike, uh, be before the, uh, the chat scrolls away from me, let me ask you a question. Uh, it's from uh, SM Ho, and his question is, what are the secondary intentions? And of course, he's relating to the primary intentions. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm going fast. Okay, so let me give you an example of a negative secondary intention. Um, the, a negative secondary intention would be something like this scenario. Somebody yells at me and makes me feel bad. So what happens is my automatic response is to yell back at him, you jerk, and I put him down. So that secondary intention is, uh, basically what I'm doing is teaching him a lesson. So I want, my secondary intention is to teach him a lesson to make him feel as bad as I feel so that he doesn't do that to me again. And when we get into negative secondary intentions, we create a vicious cycle. Whereas the positive secondary, uh, the positive secondary intention would be to say something like, when you yelled at me and said these words, I felt put down. And I don't wanna feel, I don't think I'm less than you. And I want you to stop yelling so that I, at me or anybody else, I don't think it's an effective communications method. So that's a way of taking your secondary intentions to get him to stop yelling so that I feel loved. So your primary intention is that, so I wanna feel loved. Now love, liked, it's just like feeling, wanting to feel liked is just another degree of that basic need of love. Um, I once mm -hmm. uh, was told a story about a man who was a palliative care person and um, after 20 years of palliative care and asking everybody on their deathbed, now that you're on your deathbed, what is the things that are most concerning to you? And the response after with 90% of the people was, did I love well? Did I love well? And was I loved? And when people are on their deathbed, according to this palliative care person, that was the majority of people's biggest concerns. Did I love well? And it was I loved. And I submit that feeling liked and even a friendship or an acquaintance is all about a basic need to be loved and liked and appreciated. And so I think actually from a basic level, all of our actions are in a response to either wanting to be loved at some level or to give love at some level. And a secondary negative intention is there to make a guy or a gal feel bad so that they don't make me feel bad. That's a negative secondary intention. The positive secondary intention is to get them to stop making people feel bad by being truthful, authentic, and honest and sharing my hip. So does that answer your question? Okay. Yes, sir. Oh. Uh, we'll keep going. Uh, well, um, another question. Okay. Whenever you're talking to um, someone who is driven by ego and, uh, and, 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 that, and that, of course, is the recipe for irrationality, uh, you're talking about a very logical, structured approach that makes all sorts of sense when you're dealing with logical, structured, rational people. But not everyone is rational. So How do you deal with ego-based responses? The first thing to do is to probe and find out what is behind their 
ego. So what do you want? What's going on for you? So the first way to handle a person with high ego is to probe and say, okay, so in this particular situation, what are your thoughts and why do you want to do it this way? And get to know that person and find out. Uh, so it is still the same process. And even if they're an ego, a person in ego wants to talk about themselves. And so as a salesperson, now I made over 30,000 business to business, face to face sales calls by the time I was 35 years old, I did the numbers. And when met lots of ego people, super construction superintendents, managers of refineries or gas plants or mines, lots of ego. And what I found is when I asked about them and didn't talk much about me, I was able to have more influence in that situation. And I always maintain that the best salespeople are the best questioners and the best listeners. And anytime I'm dealing with somebody with high ego, I listen way more than I talk. And I have an intention. If I'm dealing with somebody, I've got an intention and I have a desire to influence them. And I'm not going to influence a person with ego unless I understand exactly where they're coming from. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Uh, a question from Sean. What's the best way to talk to people who don't generally listen to others? If, you know, every once in a while, we're going to run into a person that we're not going to get through to. That's going to happen. And we have to make a decision whether we want any kind of a relationship with this person. But there are people that don't listen well. And with my clients, when, when we run into people like that, we actually change them out, fire them, get rid of them. If it's a, a person that we have no choice but being in a relationship with, I want you to question yourself. Do you want to be in a relationship with a person that does not listen at all? Or the other option is to actually challenge them on their listening. Say, so, you know, when I'm talking, it seems like I'm interrupted often. And I don't feel heard or respected when that happens. And it's important to just challenge the person on their listening. Now, it's very important not to label people's, when we're talking about other person and describing what they did to make me feel something, it's very important that we don't attack them. And it's very important that we don't label them with a one word behavior. You're disrespectful is not an appropriate way to approach somebody that's being disrespectful. You're being disrespectful. You're much better to say and own it in I statements. And like I say, there's five hours of video training in the whole contact program, but you're much better to say, I, when you said these words, I felt disrespected. And I think you could have chose your words better. When you hear me say that, what's your response? What do you think? That's how I would deal with that. But I can tell you that I do make, have made decisions in life to end relationships because I didn't feel heard and I know that this person is never gonna do that. And so do I wanna waste my life being in a relationship with somebody and, and no matter, and all relationship, relationships are at different degrees. So I, you know that comes and falls into play for the, um, this, this, the decision on whether I'm going to keep the relationship or not. Mike, I'm, I'm going to interpret Sean's question a little bit differently. Okay. Uh, when you're talking to somebody with whom you have a relationship that you cannot abort, children, partners, uh, uh, and you feel unlistened to, how do you get them to have those two ears and one mouth, as opposed to three mouths and one ear. If, if we can't do it on our own, because so, <clears throat> I was in one very dysfunctional relationship for a short period of time after, um, after my first divorce. And that person, I could, they wouldn't communicate with me on my level. Yet I had just come through a divorce where we never had one fight. We never used lawyers because we both communicated in the same way. Now, if it's a child, it's a real challenging thing. But you know, it's not uncommon that parents and children have estranged relationships. And 
it's just the facts of life. Some relationships don't work. And if a person, the first process, the first step that I would take, if I can't use, if, if, if I go through all my skills and I can't get through and get this person to start listening or seeing other perspectives, then the first thing I do is set up counseling and get a mediator. It's critical. Yeah. Sean is confirming that he's actually referring to somebody who's a boss. <clears throat> somebody Again, that he can't this, walk away from. Why, why are you at that job? I'm asking, Sean. If you have a boss that is not, people don't, you know, once we get into, especially into our 30s and 40s, it's very difficult to change somebody unless they admit or want to change. And you can, if you communicate effectively using this contact method, they'll either come around and you'll be able to ne negotiate and influence a little bit by asking about their hip and listening to them and then interjecting with what's going on for you and just massaging that conversation. And many difficult conversations don't happen and don't get resolved in one conversation. Crucial conversations can be two, three, four before we get a res resolution. So you got to massage this person and massage their ego. That's just the way it works. Make them feel good about themselves, listen to them, and then they may start to listen to you more. But I submit that if a person doesn't change and it is an unhealthy work environment, why are you staying? There's lots of healthy work environments out there. It might not be what you want to hear, you know, is this person open to um, having a third party come and sit with you to work through this issue? Even if he's the owner of the company, is there a general manager or somebody else in the company that he respects that could mediate that for you? In very difficult situations where it seems the person is very difficult to get through, it's often good to have a third party. And I know I have clients that have asked me to mediate certain relationships because they value all the employees and they don't want one of them to leave. Great, um, wonderful, no further questions. Okay, great, so back where I was here. Um, excuse, excuse me, so take it next level. So let's quickly do a quick uh, review of the process. First thing is, as humans, when we communicate, we sense, we feel, we think, we intend, and then we choose our action. And what you wanna do in any difficult conversation is find out what they, the other person sensed, what they heard and saw specifically. And remember, words can be interpreted, the same word can be com interpreted completely different. So you also have to, as we go through this process, find out what, their, what meaning they assign to a particular word. And you do that throughout this process. But we want to find out about their hip, we want to share ours. We first communicate with ourselves. And we ask about, we get comfortable with exactly what happened for us in this situation. And then we start to wonder. To wonder is to begin to understand. And so um, we start to wonder about what's going on with the other person in that communicate with yourself first part. Then we open up by sharing a couple parts of our human interaction process. And then we quickly notice the other person by asking about their human interaction process. Then we tune in and actively listen. And then we ask again. We clarify, make sure we understand clearly and that we got their meaning that they assign to any particular words or phrases. And we validate them and we get validated ourselves. Then we start to explore common intentions. If we have to, we start at primary and move into secondary and avoid that negative secondary intentions process of teaching people lessons and making them feel bad so that they don't make me or somebody else feel bad. And then after we uncover the common intentions, we um, identify the solutions and they happen quite naturally. Then we take it next level by assigning action items, recording those action items, sending them in a text and an email and in a commitment note. And then we do follow up. That's where I was. The last part of any conversation is to set up follow up. So something like I mentioned in that one question there, uh, often it takes more than one conversation. If we get to the point where we haven't got to solutions, it's completely okay to say, okay, so I understand what's going on for you. You understand what's going on for me. Let's sit on this for a night and we'll come and talk about this tomorrow and see if we get any new thoughts. And then we'll start to look for those solutions. Or if we agree to those solutions and action items and we send them out, then still set a time for follow-up. Let's check in in a couple of weeks. 
and do a follow-up. And that's a very important part of the sales process as well. If you're in a sales process, um, the same thing happens um, and is, is you want to get the resolve and after you've sold somebody something, you want to follow up. And even if you don't sell them something, you want to ask them for permission to follow up to see if they might want it later. So that follow-up part is very, very important to solidify any relationship. Um, so that's the contact process. Now, uh, I said that I'd give you a couple of quick tips about inspiring and motivating people. The first and most important thing that I coach all leaders and managers, make sure you have clear expectation management. You, that everybody knows exactly what is expected of them, their duties, their responsibilities, right down to um, what you know the dress code is, for example, and what cleanup looks like or housekeeping, any of that stuff. Very clear expectation management for every position in the business and have it part of the policy and procedure manual. Uh, so that's a, a very important thing so that everybody knows what's expected of them. And I tell you that 80% of people want clear direction. They want clear, they want to be told exactly what to do, when to do it and how to do it. And that's all about expectation management. They need to know what your expectations are. And the second tip that I want to give you for that is to inspire people. Tons of positive affirmation, lots of good jobs, lots of attaboys. And when you correct somebody, the actual uh, rule of thumb, and uh, uh, the way we coach this is when you've corrected somebody, you've got to give them Psychologists say seven positives for every negative. That's difficult. When I'm working with construction superintendents, they say, what? Uh, so we back that off to four, but go for four to one. When you correct somebody over the next few days, look for four opportunities that they did something well at and tell them they did a good job. There's actually a corrective conversation module within the contact program. But these are very important set expectations and tons of positive affirmation. When people do not feel appreciated, they disengage. And 69% of the North American workforce is disengaged. We know that by the numbers. It's because they mostly because they don't feel appreciated, appreciated and acknowledged for their good work. So some quick testimonials, um, we, we, we provide uh, the contact training to entire work groups. And um, it's, a, it's a fairly new product, something that I've just recently developed, but we've tested it and I've had some people review it. Bob Vaughn is actually from BC, from uh, central BC. He's a, been a communications trainer for the last 25 years and he trains people to train people. And his comments were, I was really impressed by how efficient and effective contact is to get your employees trained up to be good communicators. It's a seven step methodical program. One of the biggest problems in organizations is that employees don't have the courage and confidence to have those tough conversations. This program walks them through the process. I would strongly, strongly recommend it, this course for any organization looking to improve their motivation and communication and create a better culture. Um, uh, Ron Simonsmeyer from Alberto Construction says, steady increase in staff retention since program inception. Sam Blair from Valard Environment says, motivational, uplifting, and practical. We've already incorporated the contact communication system and masterminding technique into our toolbox, and it's proving to be highly effective uh, in all of our interactions. Uh, or many of our interactions. Michael's insightful and interactive process provided much more than a few ideas. It has helped us to be better navigate challenging situations with next level results. That's some testimonials. I've got an offer for you here today. I, um, before the, you come to your offer, you want to deal with a question? Yes, sure. Question from SM Ho. What is the difference between giving affirmation and babysitting your employees? <laughs> Babysitters. You know, the reality is there's no difference. And if you're a leader in a company, you're a babysitter, buddy, or ma'am, or buddy, I'm sorry. That's just reality. And I have that conversation constantly. We're babysitters. Now, if you're babysitting effectively, you give lots of positive affirmation. And when you, in most cases, now, I mean, there's always that balancing act. Is this guy too much effort or this gal too much effort? And are they bringing down the rest of the team? 
regardless. I'm patting him on the back and he still doesn't, or she still doesn't get it, or they're still not moving up. You know, I, I talk a lot about the bad, vi vi bad vibe virus. And if that's present in a company and there's a cause for it, we can do a lot of work. But sometimes the quickest way out of that bad vibe vi virus is to change out an employee. Um, having said that, yes, the leader's job is babysitting. And like I said, 80% of people want clear direction. 20% want to be creative and do their own thing. But the majority of people working for other people that are going to work to serve to get a paycheck, they want that very clear direction. And that looks like babysitting. It's just the way it is. From my perspective, anyway. No further questions. Okay. Uh, free offer for everybody. Um, I, have, I have a quick little, a little booklet that I wrote. Some of the information is, uh, you've heard here today. But at the end of the book is a quick two-page uh, plan for a tough conversation. So it's, the, the book is a guide to plan and design your tough conversation. You have a, a URL there, Roger. If you could post that in the chat room. Uh, it's basically at successtoolchest.com, but that's a free gift for everybody today. Um, we all, we, I also have an offer for you. The uh, special offer for today's participants, and this will expire uh, on Sunday night. But if you use the code VBN at successtoolchest.com, you can get a 50% discount on the Contact 2020 full program. And with that program, we've got a couple of bonuses. First of all, we'll give you a two-for-one membership. So that totals an $800 value. We also give you a, free, a little bit of free masterminding training on how to use the masterminding principle to guide your team effectively. Uh, that's $100 value. And so the total value is almost 900 bucks. And if you act before uh, Sunday night, you'll get it for $199.99 and that's Canadian funds. Uh, this is a new program. In 2021, we will be charging US funds. Um, you get lifetime access to contact 2020. Uh, it'll be put on an app next year and uh, science changes. And we learn new things all the time. I'm networking with communications trainers constantly. When we get new information, we'll change a video or we'll add a video and you'll get a notification. So there is true value in lifetime access. Tough conversations come up throughout life from birth until we're 99. And sometimes we need a refresher. So there actually is good value in that lifetime access. We also give you a 30 day money back guarantee. So if you're not happy, within 30 days, you can ask for your money back. There's five hours of multimedia training there, uh, video background, image background, some of me talking and so on and so forth. So take advantage of that 50% discount. The code is VBN, Vancouver Business Network, short for v Van Vancouver Business Network. Mike, a question for you. Is the workshop catered to business? It's not a workshop. That is online pre-recorded training. And it is focused on a business environment. Yes. And the way we market it to businesses, and that's what this slide is about, is that, or partly anyway, uh, is that we, rather than just train leaders, and Bob Vaughn and I have been talking about this quite a bit in the last few months, People send their leaders to training on workshops or training sessions or conferences. And I own part of the Speakers Bureau of Canada. We have 300 speakers that we send. 75% of them go to government departments. That's who our majority of our customers are. And we charge anywhere from 3,500 to 20,000 for a speaker for a keynote presentation to a workshop. And what we know from that business is that within two weeks, 80% of the information that people learn is got lost. They retain 10 to 20% after two weeks. So the way we're promoting contract, contact to businesses is, um, first of all, we give the online training to the entire company and we have a very uh, fair pricing for that process. And so instead of just training your leaders and then expecting them to train their people in something they just learned, which is unrealistic, we train the whole company in this contact process. And then we give you a one page manual. This is your, for your policy and procedure manual to, uh, this is how your company deals with tough talks. When you onboard a new person, they send us their email address, they get the training. And that's how we're marketing this to overall businesses. But we do also sell it individually. Now we are looking for um, sales partners and facilitation partners. And in the um, 
training. We, we have a separate price for the online training, and then we have a consulting product and a training product where people get access to weekly training sessions, Q and A's for a year. And there's different prices. If you're interested in that, send me an email, mike at successtoolchest.com or Roger, you can post in the chat. Uh, there's a form to fill out at successtoolchest.com uh, requesting a free 45 minute coaching session or consultation by me. And we will actually talk about your specific business. Is that the and one uh, that ends with free 20% consult? Thank you. Yep, that's it. Done. And there's also a link in there for that, uh, where you can go buy that contact 2020 and get the two for one special. Done. Uh, you can post that link there. That's the two for one if you're buying it as an individual. Done. But our focus is, my focus has always been for the last 20 years, working with businesses. And even when I owned my own business, I got out of the cellular phone industry as soon as it went retail. Even though we had the very first store in a mall in the country for cellular phones, I really much prefer to deal with business people. And so that's where my focus is. And my specialty is working with companies between 25 and 500 people. Any other questions? There's no other questions in the chat, no. And we're about bang on time here. We got three minutes left. And uh, uh, audience members, um, are, are, do you have a final question that we can pose to Mike? I, I kind of like letting people be done a little bit early anyway. It's actually nice to, oh God, we finished early for a change. Yes, I, indeed. I, you guys, if you're in business and you go to meetings, please remember the most important thing at the end of a meeting is that nobody walks out without an action item and a date that they're committing to do that. And when my clients have implemented that strategy and that guideline, and it's mandatory, it makes a massive difference. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, we, often people will miss the deadline but it's brought up at the next meeting and then they can negotiate that missed deadline. Uh, one of the most important rules in business, keep your agreements. And as soon as you know you can't keep that agreement, renegotiate. Same thing, when you get assigned an action item, as soon as you know you can't hit the date, let everybody know and reset the date. And in some cases, that action item will be assigned to somebody else because now it makes more sense to give it to this person than that person. So keep your agreements. Make sure in your meetings that you have action items. And one other tip, I use mentors all the time. I run a site called findamentor.com. Get at least four business mentors. And when you have a big challenge, run it by four business mentors and um, take what fits for you. I've never met a mentor that I wanna be exactly like, but I check in with four. I have four communications mentors, four business mentors, four spirituality mentors, and in some cases, more mentors than that. And I see mentoring as a free process and coaching as a charge for a fee process, but get lots of mentors. Another quick tip for you there and have a really good lawyer and a really good accountant. If we're in business, one of my mentors said that to me right when I started my first business, make sure you got a good lawyer, good accountant. And I'll add one thing to that. Get a good business coach. I've used coaches from the time I was 25 years old and it's made a huge difference in my peace of mind and in my success levels. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for being here and uh, hope to hear from you soon. Mike, on behalf of the VBN, I'd like to thank you. You've given us your Wednesday evening. You've given us uh, decades of experience in terms of communicate, communicating, sometimes with difficult people. Uh, I don't think there's anyone in the audience who's walking away empty handed. So we, on behalf of the audience and myself, we really appreciate the contribution that you have given to us. Thank you so much. You're welcome and thank you, Roger. Oh, one thing, commit to what area of that contact process you could be better at as individuals. Write it down and type it in the chat before you go. Forgot to ask you to do that. <laughs> thank you everybody and have a wonderful evening and a great rest of the week. Great. Thank you, Mike. Good night, thank good night you. audience. We'll um, uh, see you for some more uh, VBN speakers uh, next week. Uh, goodbye and, uh, and once more, thank you. Stay safe. Everybody bye -bye. stay safe.
Bye-bye.